The state will now make their opening statement. The defense has chosen to defer until the beginning of their case. I must caution you that the opening statements are not evidence. This is that. On Tuesday, August 4th, 2020, officers of the Oshkosh Police Department responded to a shooting on Minnesota Street in the city of Oshkosh. Upon their arrival, officers encountered a man waving them down in the street near 1715. That man had a gunshot wound through his face. As officers walked up the driveway at 1715, they encountered a man lying deceased in the driveway. That man had a gunshot wound to the side of his head. Just inside the garage at 1715 Minnesota Street was a woman bleeding from her ear. That woman also had a gunshot wound to the head. Earlier that evening, Rebecca Borkowski, her father, James Grutner, and family friend John Miller were at Rebecca's home in Oshkosh repairing a Chevy Tahoe that was parked in Rebecca's garage. Rebecca co-owned co the Tahoe with her ex-boyfriend, Joshua Aid, the defendant. Rebecca had recently ended her five-year relationship with the defendant. She intended to finalize the breakup by returning all of the defendant's property to his home, including that Chevy Tahoe. The defendant's home is in Monticello, Wisconsin, which is over two hours drive from Oshkosh. Rebecca was concerned about driving the Tahoe that distance due to a mechanical issue. On Tuesday, August 4th, 2020, Rebecca made arrangements for her father, James Grutner, and family friend, John Miller, to help her fix the Tahoe so that she could return it the following weekend, finalizing her breakup with the defendant. The three met at Rebecca's house earlier in the evening and began that repair. Shortly before 8.30 p.m., as they were finishing up putting away their tools, the defendant arrived at Rebecca's home uninvited. Rebecca will testify that she saw the defendant walking toward her. He said to her, hey boo, what you doing? And he pointed a pistol with a red laser at her. She turned and was shot in the side of the head. The bullet entered through her right ear and traveled to the back of her skull where it remained lodged. In spite of that injury, Rebecca survived. Rebecca will testify that she has no information about what happened to either John Miller or her father, James. Rebecca will testify that when she was shot, she collapsed in the garage where she remained until officers found her. You'll see her pooled blood in the garage. You'll observe her condition when officers came upon her. John Miller will testify that as he was finishing up the repair to the Tahoe, he heard the defendant say to Rebecca, hey babe, as the defendant walked toward Rebecca, John turned away. He heard a pop pop noise and looked back. When he looked back, he saw the defendant pointing a gun at him. John turned to run and was shot in the right side of his face as he ran away. The bullet entered the right side of John's face, traveled through his mouth, and out the left side of his face. John also survived. John Miller will testify that after he was shot, he continued running until he, he arrived at Rebecca's neighbor's house, two doors to the south. That neighbor was Dan Schrader. You'll hear from Dan today. John entered Dan's home and Dan called the police. That call came into dispatch at 8.27 p.m. Rebecca's father, James Grutner, was also shot in the head. You'll hear testimony from the medical examiner that the bullet entered the left side of his head, just above his ear, traveled downward through his brain, and remained lodged in his skull. James Grutner did not survive. He was pronounced deceased at the scene. 
Officers arrived on scene and immediately made contact with John and Rebecca separately. You'll see body cam that shows John in the street and Rebecca in the garage. Both John and Rebecca were able to communicate on scene, and they both told officers what happened. And I expect they will tell you the same thing when they testify in this case. They will tell you that the defendant arrived uninvited and almost immediately began shooting them. Rebecca immediately identified Joshua Aid, the defendant, as the shooter. Officers pinged Joshua's phone as he drove back to his home in Monticello, which is in Greene County, Wisconsin. The Oshkosh Police Department also put out a social media alert to the public regarding Joshua Aid. First Sergeant Peter Vargo, who is a friend and colleague of both the defendant and Rebecca, saw that social media alert. Mr. Vargo will testify that upon seeing the social media alert, he called the defendant that night, and the defendant answered. Mr. Vargo will testify that the defendant denied any knowledge of a shooting and claimed that he was just driving home from work. Shortly after that call with Mr. Vargo, the defendant was located attempting to enter his driveway in Monticello, and he was taken into custody by Greene County Sheriff's deputies. You're going to hear from one of those Greene County deputies, Sergeant Knabel. You'll see the Greene County deputies' video of their initial encounter with the defendant. You'll observe the defendant's condition upon exiting his vehicle. You'll hear the defendant's manner of speech, and you'll hear him indicate repeatedly that he has no idea why officers would be at his property or detaining him. When the defendant was taken into custody, a loaded Ruger 380 pistol was located in his pocket. Officers also found another gun in his vehicle. A loaded revolver was in the front passenger area. The defendant was taken to the Oregon Police Department where two detectives from the Oshkosh Police Department first made contact with him. Those detectives will testify that the defendant denied any knowledge of what was going on and denied he was in a shooting. You'll hear that officers on scene recovered three shell casings the night of the shooting. A portion of a jacket from a bullet was located at the scene about 10 days later. All three casings and that jacket were examined by a firearms and projectile specialist with the Wisconsin Crime Lab. She will testify that those items were all determined to have been fired from the 380 Ruger located in Joshua Aid's pocket when he was taken into custody by Greene County deputies. The bullet lodged in James Brutner's head was recovered during his autopsy. The bullet lodged in Rebecca's head was recovered during a surgery she had last December. Both bullets were also determined to have been fired from the 380 Ruger located in Joshua Aid's pocket. You'll hear testimony that on the night of the shooting, Rebecca gave officers access to her home, her garage, her vehicles, her cell phone, and even her face Facebook login account information. She allowed them access to search anything they deemed necessary in connection with this case. Rebecca will testify that she is a gun owner herself, but that all of her guns were inside of her home the night the defendant arrived. You will hear testimony that four of her guns were located by officers inside her home the night of the shooting. The fifth is also accounted for as being inside the home that night. Rebecca's aunt, Sharon Morgano, will testify that she saw the fifth inside a purse in Rebecca's home two days after the shooting and while Rebecca was still hospitalized. Rebecca voluntarily turned that gun over to police as well. You'll also hear testimony from three of Rebecca's neighbors. Although none of these neighbors saw the shooting itself, all three will testify to hearing a noise they described, like the popping of fireworks shortly prior to officers responding. None of them heard any disturbance prior to that sound. The closest neighbor in proximity is a woman named Ryan. She is so close that she shares a driveway with Rebecca. 
Ryan will testify that she heard no disturbance, but was drawn to her window when she heard a pop-pop noise. She looked out her window and saw the defendant standing in Rebecca's driveway. I'm also going to present evidence to you that answers the question of why, or what was the defendant's motive in committing this act. To do that, I plan to walk you through the history of the relationship between Rebecca and the defendant. Rebecca will testify to past incidents of violence during their five-year relationship. She'll testify that in the spring of 2020, she made the decision to end the relationship. She'll testify that the defendant would not accept that. You'll hear the defendant's own words through text messages he sent to Rebecca as she was trying to end the relationship. In addition to text messages, I'm going to present to you their Facebook Messenger communication in the one week period leading up to the shooting. You will again see the defendant's own words and you will see his repeated efforts to keep Rebecca in the relationship. As we continue through the Facebook Messenger exchange, you will see Rebecca reference this property exchange that was to be her final step to completely ending her relationship with the defendant. She tells the defendant that she intends to fix the Tahoe and return it the following weekend. She tells the defendant that she found someone to help her with that repair. That person is family friend John Miller. You will see the defendant's comments asking if John is her new boyfriend. Rebecca even provides John's number to the defendant so that he can call John Miller and confirm that John is qualified to repair the Tahoe. John will testify that he did receive a call from the defendant. He will testify that the defendant told him that he better not come to Rebecca's property that day. You will see the defendant's communication to Rebecca demanding that she not fix the Tahoe. The Facebook exchange on August 4th, 2020 ends with a message from the defendant to Rebecca at 4.18 p.m. saying, don't touch the radiator. You're going to also hear testimony from an Oshkosh Police Department analyst. She reviewed downloads of Rebecca's, James's, and John's phones, as well as the defendant's phone. You will hear about call logs between the defendant and Rebecca from August 4, 2020, the day of the shooting. There are completed calls between the defendant and Rebecca between 3 p.m. and 5.29 p.m. Rebecca will explain the nature of those calls. The call log will show that after a final call at 5.29 p.m., there are numerous calls made by the defendant to Rebecca, which Rebecca does not answer. Rebecca will testify that she left her phone in her vehicle and did not want to continue talking to the defendant about the relationship or about the Tahoe. Between 6.36 p.m. and 8.05 p.m., there are a total of 31 calls the defendant made to Rebecca. They all went unanswered. The analysts you will hear from will show you a map of cell phone towers the defendant's phone was communicating with when he made those 31 calls to Rebecca. You will see the tower connections moving from the Monticello area toward the Ashash area during that time period. The final unanswered call the defendant makes to Rebecca is at 8.05 p.m. That call communicates with the cell phone tower in Fond du Lac at 8.05 p.m. Dan Schrader's 911 call comes in at 8.27 p.m. The evidence will show that after weeks of trying to change Rebecca's mind about the breakup, after expressing his belief that John Miller was Rebecca's new boyfriend, after demanding Rebecca not touch the Tahoe, after calling Rebecca 31 times in an hour and a half period while he drove over two hours to her home uninvited, only 22 minutes elapsed between Joshua A's last cell phone tower communication in Fond du Lac at 8.05 to a completed shooting of three people in Oshkosh. At the close of the evidence in this case, we're gonna walk through all of this again, and I will ask you to return a verdict of guilty as to all three counts. Thank you. <laughs>